But I would also like to ask Canada's 1%, in fact, Canada's 0.13%, to consider this. What kind of a Canada do you want to live in? Finance Minister Christia Freeland has really lost it this time. Her latest rant blames Canada's wealthy for the country's problems in a way that would be funny if it wasn't so serious. She's using wild threats and scare tactics to deflect from her government's massive failures, desperately trying to avoid admitting that the Trudeau liberals have practically bankrupted Canada. Freeland is pointing fingers at doctors, entrepreneurs, and other hardworking high achievers, saying they need to pay more to fix problems her government created. It's classic gaslighting people. She's trying to cover up nearly a decade of fiscal dumpster fires by blaming the rich. When Freeland goes on about hungry children and teens who can't afford birth control, remember that poverty, unaffordable housing, and skyrocketing debt have all gotten worse under Trudeau's watch. Now she wants to squeeze more taxes out of Canada's top earners to pay for her reckless spending sprees. It's basically blackmail dressed up as social justice. Her plan is as illogical as it is dangerous. You don't fix a sinking ship by drilling more holes in the hull, but that's exactly what Freeland wants to do by punishing the wealthy. Her socialist policies have already shrunk Canada's economy to the point where we're now a breakdown nation. Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. Before we jump into today's video, take a second to sign up for our exclusive uncensored newsletter. The mainstream media won't report Trudeau's scandals and corruption, but our newsletter delivers the raw truth to your inbox daily. We'll leave you the link in the description box. Now let's dive into today's crazy developments. In a desperate move, Freeland is now blaming Canada's problems on the nation's wealthiest citizens. After nine years of the Trudeau Liberals' fiscal irresponsibility and economic mismanagement, Freeland wants the top 1% to bail out the country. Her plan? Slap more taxes on the rich to cover up her government's failures. In a recent press conference, Freeland's masterclass in gaslighting was on full display. She threw out questions like, do you want to live in a country where kids go to school hungry? And do you want to live in a country where a teenage girl gets pregnant just because she doesn't have the money to buy birth control? But I would also like to ask Canada's 1%. In fact, Canada's 0.13% to consider this. What kind of a Canada do you want to live in? Her aim was to shift the blame for Canada's problems onto the richest citizens, but there's a darker twist to her words. Freeland's warnings about Canada's troubles conveniently skip over the fact that her government, led by Trudeau, has been running the show for nine years. The issues she points out, like child hunger, expensive housing, and lousy health care, have actually gotten worse on their watch. By pointing fingers at the wealthy, she's trying to cover up her own party's role in these messes. Her talk about needing more cash from the top 1% to fix things is really just admitting that the liberal government is screwed up financially. They've blown billions on failed projects like the Arrive Can app and green slush funds and mishandled money meant for infrastructure and health sector. Instead of fixing these mistakes, Freeland is using scare tactics to squeeze more money out of high earners like doctors and entrepreneurs suggesting society will fall apart without their extra contributions. And let's not miss the irony when she talks about debt piling up for future generations. That debt is a direct result of her government's wild spending. Instead of cutting waste or being more efficient, she wants more money from those who are already heavily taxed. Freeland's vision of the wealthy hiding in gated communities while the public sphere crumbles isn't a warning. It's a reality her government has helped create. By not addressing the real causes of economic inequality and social decline, the Trudeau administration is paving the way for the dystopia she describes. In a nutshell, Freeland's speech is a masterclass in gaslighting. She's trying to twist public perception, making the wealthy the bad guys, while it's her government's policies that have caused the very issues she's complaining about. Her game plan is obvious. Deflect blame, scare people, and grab more money under the banner of social responsibility. So pay attention to what Freeland is really saying. The stakes are high, but not for the reasons she claims. The real danger is letting a government that has consistently mismanaged resources and failed to deliver on promises keep shifting the blame and demanding more from its citizens. The Trudeau administration's failures are now being used as an excuse to squeeze more out of Canada's top earners. So when you hear such rhetoric, you quickly come to realize that Canada is in crisis. After nearly a decade of liberal rule under Justin Trudeau, our once proud nation has become a global example of economic decline. 
and rather than take responsibility, Finance Minister Christia Freeland is shamelessly scapegoating Canada's most successful citizens. Now, as I walk you through the details of the coming tax reform, I want to start by emphasizing that the changes we're making are focused exclusively on investment profits known as capital gains. When someone sells an investment that has appreciated in value, like a portfolio of stocks or a rental property, they accrue a capital gain. In Canada, these gains are taxed below the rate that we all pay on regular income. Today, in fact, only half of the capital gain is taxed at all. So if someone makes a $2 million profit on a stock sale, they pay tax on only $1 million of that gain. That's a big advantage. And so, beginning on June 25th, well-off Canadians will pay tax on two-thirds of their capital gains instead of just one-half. I want to highlight four important points about this change. First, all Canadians will continue to pay no capital gains tax at all when they sell their principal residence. Any money you make on the sale of your home is yours to keep. Second, the tax changes do not apply to the first $250,000 of capital gains every single year. The higher rate applies only to gains above this $250,000 threshold. Now that means that most Canadians will still be able to sell successful investments without paying a higher rate. For example, a couple who owns a rental apartment will pay no additional tax on the first $500,000 in profit from a sale. Third, we're increasing the lifetime capital gains exemption for those who sell their small business or farm. Gains up to $1.25 million will now be entirely tax free. And fourth, to encourage innovation and job creation, we're introducing a new incentive for entrepreneurs that will reduce the amount of tax they pay on capital gains and increase the lifetime exemption on the sale of all or part of their business. In the end, and this is key, we estimate that only 0.13% of Canadians with an average annual income of $1.4 million will be affected by this change in any given year. But millions more, especially younger Canadians, will benefit from it. As chair of Rockefeller International Ruchir Sharma observed, Canada is now a leader in breakdown nations, former economic powerhouses that have severely deteriorated. In an alarming Financial Times piece titled A Warning from the Breakdown Nations, Sharma singled out Canada for its rapidly declining GDP and inability to adapt to the digital economy, leaving us lagging behind technologically advanced countries. Take Canada first, Sharma wrote, noting how we completely missed the boat when the world moved on, driven by big tech instead of commodities. He pointed to our per capita GDP shrinking 0.4% annually since 2020, worse than any other developed nation. New investment and job growth is driven mainly by the government, with private sector action confined largely to the property market, which does little for productivity and prosperity. Under Trudeau's watch, Canada's turned into a textbook example of a country going down the drain. Our living costs have shot up and finding a place to live is like searching for a needle in a haystack. Young people are drowning in debt, dreaming of owning a home that's just out of reach. Our healthcare system, once the pride of the nation, is falling apart and waiting times are off the charts. But instead of owning up to their mess, Freeland's pointing fingers at Canada's high earners. 
in her big speech about the disastrous fairness for every generation budget. She basically told the top 0.13% of earners, hey, it's on you to fix everything. She wants the wealthy to dig deeper into their pockets to cover health care, housing, pensions, and even school lunches for the less fortunate. As the election nears, the liberals are gearing up to use class warfare as a distraction. This move aims to polarize voters and divert attention from Trudeau's government failures over the past nine years. By blaming the richest Canadians for the country's problems, they hope to shift the focus away from their own policy mistakes and fiscal mismanagement. You'll hear more speeches like Christia Freeland's, painting a bleak picture of inequality and proposing higher taxes on the wealthy as a solution. This conveniently ignores how the Trudeau administration has contributed to rising public debt, deteriorating services, and growing economic disparity. After nearly a decade of missteps, it's time for a serious change. We need to kick out the fiscally reckless liberals and bring in leadership that values fiscal responsibility, supports the private sector, and respects high achievers. Well, that's all for now. Should Canada's top earners be vilified for the failures of the Trudeau government? Or are higher taxes just a band-aid over their fiscal mismanagement? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't, please subscribe and leave a like for this video. Your support helps us continue our work. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support, and I will see you in the next one.